So today, this is kind of going to be a quick one, I do believe, because we already know that Transformers Prime was a fantastic, fabulous series. And this really kind of concludes my Christmas haul from 2018. Yeah, I know, it's long overdue. But I wanted to re-watch the entire series and all of the extra bonus features. All of them, every single one. Uh, and it took a while to do it because... There's a lot of people in this household. What do you want? Nevertheless, the Transformers Prime series is going to be our focus, and it's going to conclude my look at my 2018 Christmas haul in the latest Got By True review. Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host, your most humble host, Dennis Moulton, a.k.a. Gotbot. As always, please like, comment, share, of course, subscribe, and while you're at it, that's right, hit that notification bell, please, because it lets you know when content of all kinds goes up here on the channel. Check out Machinery of Man, The Everything Factor, Transformers Collectors, NL, The Autobot Family. Have a look for me everywhere across social media. And this is the Transformers Prime series. This is the entire series. I believe Starscream Wife, because she got me this, I believe Starscream Wife, like, bought... I don't think it was bought as one thing. Like, I think she just kind of amalgamated it together. Like, I think it was Complete Season 1, Complete Season 2, Complete Season 3, and then the Predacons Rising film. Uh, of it all, the Predacons Rising film, I think, is the only one that... Yeah, I think so. I think that's the only one that's Blu-ray. Um, honestly, I don't notice much of a difference between DVD and Blu-ray. I, I don't know. I don't have technology that picks it up, really. It's a little bit better, but... Uh, I'm fine with blue. I'm fine with DVD. Whatever. It's the same. You know, it's the same shows and it's the same bonus features. So I'm cool with it, man. I'm just saying, cool with it. Um, it was a fantastic series, and the bonus features. Well, we'll talk about how successful they are at being bonus features. And was it worth getting? Absolutely. We already know that. We're not going to grade it the same. But let's head over to the table and talk about the series and the bonus features just a little bit. And so, yes, indeed, laid before you here is the entire Transformers Prime series from Season 1 right up to and including the Predacons Rising film that kind of concluded everything off. Originally, in the United States, this whole uh, movement is all I can really call it because it really helped to reinvigorate the franchise, began on November 26th of 2010 with the five-part opener... Uh, Darkness Rising. Funny enough, we also somewhere here have the uh, like DVD set of Darkness Rising, if I'm not mistaken. And the rest of the season in the US came out in February of 2011, and subsequent seasons also came out in the spring. Season 2 in February, Season 3 in March, and the whole thing kind of topped off on October the 4th of 2013 with Predacons Rising. In Canada, it was a little bit different. Here, the entire series, just as all of these series are, was shown on Teletoon. It started on January 9th of 2011, so a little bit later, and we ended things uh, in terms of the main series on August the 16th of 2013, and then we had to wait until November 15th of 2013 to see Predacons Rising. And this series, from beginning to end, did not disappoint. One of my absolute favorite all along. The whole series, beginning to end, from the visuals to the storytelling, to the nuances, to the character development was beautifully done. The story basically begins three years after the Decepticon conflict and the Autobots are on Earth and that's sort of where things pick up when they kind of get in contact with Jack and Miko and Raph and uh, Megatron comes back and says, you know, I have returned and that's kind of where everything picks up. And indeed, season one is probably best known for not only introducing us to several characters, but it was the season where there was so much character development. The relationships between both human and robot 
were enhanced and added to. In almost every single episode, we learned the history of several of the characters and why they have certain motivations that we have. The packaging for this part of the set is beautiful. We have what looks like an Earth background with kind of a blue Energy take on it. Um, might even be Dusk or Dawn. We have, of course, Optimus and Megatron on the front. On the back, of course, we have some of the, uh, I'd say, like, screenshots from the uh, series. We also have uh, Ratchet, and we have Bulkhead. Um, again, it's just, it's nice. Inside is pretty, pretty bland. It's, you know, it is what it is. It's a DVD set. We have Optimus on one of the, one of the discs. We have B here on another. We have Megatron. I'm not even sure which way to turn him. Is it Megatron? It is. Oh, there, 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 there. Pardon me. We have Megatron on another and probably Starscream? Mm, I think it's Soundwave, actually. On uh, the last one. Uh, fun fact, we've actually already looked at the series. I looked at the G1 box set a long time ago in episode 141. I looked at the movie, the 86 movie in episode 228. I looked at the entire Beast Wars series in episode 370, and I, I got, I touch on Beast Machines in, uh, I believe, my 2018 Christmas haul. Maybe I got this before that. Maybe I got this for my birthday. I don't remember now. Uh, but I talked about Beast Machines in episode 482, just briefly, just touching on it. And I honestly see Beast Machines as the last season of Beast Wars because it does kind of continue that story once they finally left Earth and made it back to Cybertron, what sort of happened there. But that's another discussion and another time. I think I actually did talk about Beast Machines in one of the Thursday Night Live shows. Can't tell you which one, though. Um, nevertheless, this is about Transformers Prime. And in Season 1, as I said, we had all of those uh, relationships sort of build. In Master Student... Starscream is technically in charge of the Decepticons, and it's kind of the first time we really saw Starscream kind of reach his goal of leading the Decepticons. Oddly enough, it was very early in the series, and he'd done everything he could to make sure that Megatron would stay deactivated and never kind of come back around. Which, you know, it, it's fine. I get it. Um, perhaps the episode that's the most kind of goofy in this season would be Scrap Heap, where we're introduced to Scraplets. Uh, Con Job is notable not only because it's the introduction of Wheeljack, but it's the only episode where we have the character of Makeshift. And we never see Makeshift in his own form. Makeshift is uh, basically disguised as a Wheeljack double to infiltrate the Autobot base and does a great job of it, but by the end of the episode, he is blown up by a grenade. So it's the one and only time we, we kind of saw that character, and I don't think we've ever had any sort of plastic representation of him at all. Arguably, uh, the episode that is probably the best character development and also one of the like creepiest, most menacing, uh, almost most troubling episodes throughout all three seasons would have to be predatory where Arachnid kind of hunts uh, RC and Jack in the woods. It really helps set up Arachnid as a formidable villain while building the relationship between RC and Jack because RC had already been kind of burned in the past by having partners that died on her and she kind of didn't want to get close to Jack and this really helped forge their bond a lot in this episode. I still say that it stands as one of the greatest episodes. And then season one ended in a very epic fashion where we learned that, you know, the reason that Earth and Cybertron have been linked through history is because Unicron is embedded in the core of Earth. What a brilliant idea. A lot of people didn't like it at first, but I think looking back in terms of storytelling and in terms of taking the franchise and turning it on its ear and giving us like a surprise that we sort of wouldn't expect, that was phenomenal at the time. When it comes to the bonus features on this set, there are a number of them. Uh, the first is the audio commentary. Some of them are great, especially the ones for Darkness Rising are fantastic and the ones toward the end of the season are fantastic. There's a few that are kind of almost, I'll say throwaways. Uh, throughout the season. The ones for 
um, Scrap Heap. I, I think it's great that they try to include everyone from voice actors to producers to artists to production staff to like the, you know, the people that work at the concessions table, whatever. Everyone that worked on this series had a chance to do, I think, some of these audio commentaries if they wanted to. But, like, while some of them are done well in time with the episodes, others are, like, there's one that's an interview, basically, with Peter Cullen, and you watch the episode, and then you watch it with the audio commentary, and you almost forget that the episode is even going on in the background, and you just listen to the discussion and the insights um, that come from, uh, you know, Peter Cullen himself, and, and it's just, it's a joy just to listen to him. But then you have something like Scrap Heap, and the audio commentary, like, it's fine, but it doesn't really add or detract anything. There was one girl in it, and I don't know what her name is or what her job was, and it was funny because she was like, look how cute the Scraplets are. Oh, they're adorable, and they are adorable until they kind of go down on their four paws, I, I, I guess we'll call it, and they open their chompers. Uh, and they ain't so adorable anymore. Uh, the making of feature is all right. It's definitely dated now because, of course, they talk about the technology and whatnot used at the time. But even from season one to the end of season three, you could see a huge development and change in those technologies. In part because the technology advanced, but also in part because the communication between the studio and Polygon improved. And Polygon done the art, and they ended up taking more liberties, and they ended up kind of finding their groove and being able to improve on things. Even simple things like reflections and shadows, nuances of movement improved over time. Uh, we saw a featurette for the accompanying uh, line that was released and it's dated, it, it's funny. It, it was sort of looking forward to, these are you know the items that are gonna be released and the characters that are gonna be released. But now we look back and we say, oh, they were so good. They were so, so good. Engineered so well, represented the character so fantastic. Now they did end off um, kind of tipping the scale and being very difficult. They're definitely for fans that are very experienced with conversion techniques and the engineering and how parts move. Definitely not for the novice. And there was a season two preview, which is kind of useless looking back now. Nevertheless, season one is a win. The featurettes are a mixed bag. I would definitely say listen to the audio commentaries and probably the uh, couple of featurettes. The season two preview, you can probably skip that. What about season two? Because we know at the end of this, we had the epic realization and battle with Unicron. And right at the very end, you talk about leaving fans with a cliffhanger. Optimus had kind of lost his memory, refers to Megatron as Megatronus, and thinks he's once again Orion Pax. Boom. Season ends. And in season two, we start off really with Optimus as Orion Pax, and he is trusting Megatron or Megatronus and goes back with the Decepticons, and he's kind of a Decepticon, leaving Team Prime without, well, Prime. And the cover is again Optimus and Megatron seemingly locked in battle, or about to be locked in battle. Uh, the discs inside are all the same with just an Autobot and Decepticon logo. On the back we have B and Bulkhead and some screenshots from the season. And just a couple of things worth noting here. This was almost a bit of a filler season. Like, it was great episodes throughout, but not a lot stood out to me. Not like it did with season one. We did have uh, see, um, episode eight that stood out. That was Nemesis Prime, where it's a different take on Nemesis Prime. He's not created by Unicron or he's not a Decepticon this time. He's kind of an auto, he's kind of a, an Optimus clone, so to speak, that was built by Mech and I believe controlled by Silas. In fact, Silas ends up being the, the like human wreckage that he is because Optimus defeats Nemesis and both Nemesis and like the building that Silas is kind of controlling Nemesis from. Like it all caves in on Silas. Flying Mind was an interesting episode where the Nemesis ship gets its own kind of ability to think. Uh, that was a great episode, uh, one where <laughs> Megatron is not pleased that that happens at all. New Recruit happened this season where we were introduced to Smokescreen, who would become a pretty significant character going forward. In fact, he would even be up at one point for being a Matrix bearer. But the, here's the thing that stands out about season two. The end, at the end of the season, the bad guys won. The Decepticons won.
They were making Dark Mount on Earth. The bad guys won, and that's how the season ends. Yep, the Decepticons win. And it's how often do you see that the bad guys actually win? Where we were left with a cliffhanger for season one, with Optimus thinking he's Orion, in season two we're kind of left with a sense of hopelessness because all of a sudden now, it looks like the bad guys have won. In terms of the bonus featurettes on this one, we don't really have any audio commentary, which is fine because this was a lot quicker to go through. We do have a, an interview with the creative team and it was okay, but I, I sort of expected it to be more informed than what it was and I felt like they stumbled a bit over their thought processes and their answers to some of the questions. Uh, or maybe they were trying to avoid things, avoid spoilers for things going forward. Now there were some interesting tidbits in there, I definitely think it's worth watching, but don't hold your hopes kind of too high that you're going to learn a lot that you probably didn't already know if you are a hardcore fan. The more interesting interview here was the one with Peter Cullen, um, done with Larry King, and that was from SDCC 2012, it's definitely dated now, I mean it's eight years ago that that happened, but it's still a really interesting um, interview, very always interesting to hear uh, Peter Cullen's thoughts, but if you, again, are a fan like I am a fan, and I assume you probably are, then you've probably seen that interview already. I mean, it's fun to rewatch it, but I, again, in doing so, for me, it wasn't new information. It was like, oh, yes, I remember that now. Um, pretty simple, straightforward season with the bad guys winning, which brings us to the far more controversial and sometimes plotting season that was the Beast Hunters. And again, I found this kind of interesting. It was a shorter season, half the episodes of the other ones, and there's a lot of story elements that either had to become condensed or cut, and I think that's why certain aspects of this season feel like they're rushed, and certain aspects feel like they're plotting, and certain aspects feel like they're not completely fleshed out. I think had they either had another season or had the green light to do a full 26 episodes, I believe we would look back at season three far more fondly than what we do now. Don't get me wrong, it was great to have the introduction and development of Predaking from kind of mindless beast to what he became, but being named Beast Hunters, perhaps more of them should have had upgrades just like they did in their plastic forms. I mean, the only one who had the accompanying upgrade was Optimus, and perhaps we should have actually had more beasts. That would have been nice, but I'll get to that in a few moments. The cover here again has Optimus and has Optimus in his new form no less and Megatron and of course the Predaking in behind. On the discs inside we have the Well of All Sparks, I don't know. And then on the back as is often the case we have Optimus and we have uh, screen images. The bonus features here include uh, again audio tracks and they're mostly pretty good here. The gentleman, and I can't remember his name, who voices Shockwave is in a lot of them. And I love his voice. It's such a deep, you know, baritone voice. But he, all he talks about is Shockwave. I would have liked to have heard more of his thoughts about some of the other story elements and some of the other characters. I don't know if it's a lack of familiarity or not, and that's why he focuses on the character that he voiced and that he knows. But I wish that there had been a little more diversity in the thoughts that he shared. It was great what he shared. I just wish there was more diversity to it. We did have some of the other voice actors and whatnot there. It was, it was fun hearing these, and of course, these were toward the end of the series, so even they are kind of looking back and saying, hey, this has been a blast to do. And I appreciate that. So I think the audio commentaries are pretty great on this season for the most part. There was an SDCC panel that's shown. Uh, not, I watched it. Had I had my time back, I would have saved myself the 15, 20 minutes or whatever it is that it is. It's not, it doesn't really add a whole lot. It's pretty dated is the thing. It's not that it's bad. It's just that it's obviously dated since we've had, you know, robots in disguise follow. We've had Predacons rising follow. Uh, we've had Cyberverse follow and we have the impending uh, Warp Cybertron Siege Netflix series. Uh, you know, kind of too calm. There is a, maybe that's the only featurette on this, I think. I, I believe that's the only featurette. So... Not the best, but I think the audio commentaries kind of make up for it here. They're pretty good. 
going through the season, what you do learn listening to the interviews and some of the commentaries is, hey, we had planned to do this, but we weren't able to do it. Or we had wanted to go into you know this aspect. Like One of the things they talk about is that there were supposed to be more wreckers and they weren't able to do that. They weren't able to fit it in. I believe they've said that there were supposed to be more beasts and they weren't able to fit it in. I suspect that there were probably ideas to have more of the Autobots get upgrades that also didn't happen. Why we didn't get the green light for a full 26 episode season, I don't know. But what I do like is, and they acknowledge this, is they say that like we knew in advance kind of that we were ending. So it allowed us to kind of pick out the most important story elements that we wanted to include so that we could give the season kind of the feel that we would have liked for it to have as best we could while also getting in all of those story elements. And apparently it was decided very early on that it was going to be Bumblebee who was going to be the demise of Megatron at the end of the season. In terms of uh, kind of, I'll say, significant things that end the season, uh, the episode known as Prey. I think that might have introduced us to Predaking. Maybe he was introduced an episode earlier. It did introduce us, I believe, as well to Ultra Magnus. I think that one of the best episodes of the entire, entire run of this whole series for its humor, for its foreboding, for it just plain being scary. And it ties, if not surpasses, uh, Predatory from Season 1, where Arachnid is hunting, I think the, one of the best episodes that there was for the whole series was Thirst, where basically it's a de, de, like a Decepticon zombie plague that breaks out of board the Nemesis, um, and you kind of have uh, Knockout and Starscream being the bumbling buddy duo, and things have to sort of be rectified by Megatron. It's, it is such a well done, creepy story. I, I don't know when it aired, but I keep thinking that like that had to come out around Halloween. It had to, because it fits in with it just so well. The end of the season and the series was such poetic justice with Optimus getting his upgrade, finally, uh, you know, being able to use that it to its full advantage. The uh, kind of like epic encounter happens so quickly but it's so epic in the span of about a minute and a half you have optimus and peril above earth and they're high enough that like they're held here's the thing now some people have asked why was optimus hanging off that like omega lock thing in space they were in space there shouldn't have been gravity actually there would be they were in a low or earth orbit which means that you know the gravity was enough that it would keep the item in orbit they themselves are made of metal, so gravity was still having an effect on them because they're low enough in the atmosphere. High enough to stay up, but low enough that it would still have an effect and be able to pull them down if nothing was holding them there. Like stabilizing engines or something. So you had Optimus hanging in peril. You had Megatron ready to finish him. I mean, Megatron had won. He had beaten Optimus. He had won. And I thought it was so brilliant because we saw B... Uh, die earlier and it, it's just really by luck by chance that he fell in the uh, like energon pool and that that's the thing that repaired him so he could finish off Megatron and then you see Megatron there and like he's reaching back to get his sword and he realizes like it's not really there and his arm is not working right he looks at it and he, it's almost like he doesn't understand why it's not working after he's been like I guess stabbed through his chest and you see his eyes go dark you see his Decepticon symbol go dark his hand is on the blade he slips off it's so artistic and poetic so beautifully done and of course then he falls back to earth down into the abyss of the ocean such a poetic end such a fitting end and then there was apparently plans to have Optimus do this whole kind of like he does in the movie like you know I am Optimus Prime and I send this message out to Autobots, blah, 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 blah. But they didn't do that. Instead, at the end, after the goodbyes are done, the heartfelt goodbyes and stuff are done, 
And again, they're quick, but they're effective. You know, like, you know, B doesn't know what to say, or rap doesn't know what, what to, sorry, uh, what was it, was it B? I think it was like B doesn't know what to say, and like, Raph's like, it's okay, and B's like, yeah, I never had to say anything, like, you always knew, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just touching, but it's only a few seconds. And at the very end, Optimus doesn't say anything. He just starts to, to kind of, you know, give one last look at all of his friends, all of his human friends that are going to be left there. And he turns and just walks back through, like, the space bridge or whatever, and boom, that's it. It's done. Like, it was just a quiet goodbye. Uh, it, it just, it fit. It absolutely fit. I thought it was so well done. What a way to c conclude the season. But of course, the story wasn't quite done yet. We did have Predacons Rising, which is basically three episodes in one. Now, unlike the other three that I have there that are the DVDs, this is the DVD Blu-ray pack. Uh, again, I like that they did this, and so did the creators, because it gave them a way to kind of tie up sort of loose ends that they wanted to tie up that they didn't get to do within the season. Things such as, uh, like, Unicron's final stand. We did get a couple of extra Predacons here for Predaking to command. And while they started kind of savage and beastly, when those three Predacons you know, bravely look to hold off the horde of Terracons created by Unicron. Like, there's something super duper heroic about that. I mean, they don't hold them off. Everybody goes down to the Well of All Sparks. But just the fact that they were brave enough to do it, and there was only three of them, and for a few moments they did manage to do it, but until they were overwhelmed, it totally turned the Predacons from, oh, these are bad guys, to, wow, look how heroic they are. They are. They're not bad guys. They're not good guys. They're just trying to survive. We saw Knockout kind of change his colors, and we saw B and a couple of others literally change their colors. The threat of Unicron again was great. I love the fact that he used Megatron's body. And really, Megatron, he who is, you know, always full of tyranny and suffering and conquering, is now finally conquered. His consciousness is fully there and aware, and he can watch what his body is doing under the command of Unicron. But he can't do anything about it. That's the thing. He can just watch because he's not the one in control. The way they empty the Allspark and trap Unicron in it is brilliant. The end is just fantastic. And then Optimus, of course, having to make that ultimate sac sacrifice because we all know how noble Optimus is. But he doesn't present it as, oh, uh, you know, this is Optimus dying. He presents it as it's another transformation. I'm going from this corporeal, uh, physical body to now like a spiritual type of body. It was also something very spiritual and religious to it, if you will. There's some very deep messages and undertones accompanied with fantastic action here. Amazingly, Starscream manages to survive until the end when he's in that throne at Dark Mount and he decides he's going to give it up to Predaking. And we assume that Predaking kind of destroyed him, which we found out later wasn't actually the case. Nevertheless, this has a running time of, I think, like 66 minutes. But it feels longer. It feels like a lot is accomplished in that time. I feel like by the end of it we have an, like an established Cybertron that's going to bring back life thanks to Optimus. Uh, we have Autobots able to make their way back. They're going to live pretty peacefully with, Predaking, uh, with Predacons. Megatron goes off into space. He's disbanded the Decepticons. They are no more. Uh, Starscream is kind of left at loose ends and to the kind mercies of the Predacons. And the Predacons will probably live in peace themselves. All very fitting and poetic, of course. We now know that this was followed up by the 2015 Robots in Disguise series, which in and of itself, like, it, I guess it was fine, but it felt like it had been far more simplified, at least within the first season. What I did like about that, and what I do think connected it to this lore, was the fact that we did have, you know, an episode where Soundwave came back from the Shadow Zone. I thought that, that was great. He had a certain plan. Starscream, we find out, did in fact survive and kind of took command of a bunch of vehicons and stuff. He not only survived, but apparently he killed the three Predacons, I believe. It's very much glossed over, which is a shame. There should have been more to that explanation and story. How did he survive? But it's amazing that he did. 
Shockingly, we never did see Megatron again. I think that that was a loose end from our ID that we should have at least had something that told us where Megatron was. And we did, we did find out that the spiritual form of Optimus is kind of trained by um, Micronus so that he could return to clear the name of Team Prime. And we find out that the Autobot Council that had been established on Cybertron was infiltrated by, you know, Decepticons. And that's why Team Prime was blamed for everything that they were blamed for. And again, by the end of our ID, there's a certain resolution that vindicates Team Prime for all of the potential wrongdoing that had happened. Would I say it's a true and rightful sequel to this? No. As a matter of fact, I like to look at this as its own thing. But, considering this ends with Optimus kind of making that ultimate sacrifice so that new life can come back to Cybertron, it is nice to know that at the end of the day, he, in fact, did make a triumphant return to, you know, his corporeal form that he, once again, was the leader that we all know and love. In terms of being a series, what was Transformers Prime? A 10. One of the best that there ever was for storytelling and character development and its art. I am excited to know that Polygon is doing apparently the artwork for the upcoming uh, Netflix Siege War for Cybertron series. I expect it to be beautifully done. I don't know if those expectations will hold true or not. Time shall tell. But if they can do as good a work on that as they did on this, we will have a second coming of a fantastic series, I have to believe. Should you add this series to your collection? Absolutely. To this day, all these years later, still one of, if not the best, that there ever was. And here we are once again, and clearly by now you know that the best bonus features are from Season 1 and Season 3. Season 2 is an eh, awesome season, but the bonus features are not great. Uh, and the bonus feature on Predacons Rising, while it talks a little bit about Polygon, it's really more the guys talking about Polygon, uh, whatever. But I'll say this, I am absolutely stoked at the idea that the upcoming this year, now 2020, that the upcoming Transformers War for Cybertron Siege Netflix series is apparently going to be animated by Polygon. And if they can do what they did with this, or something close to it, for Siege, it's going to be at least an, ama an amazing looking series. Hopefully well written. We'll see. Um, yeah, this is, this is, I think, a series that a lot of fans deserve to have. When you watch it back to back, you really get to see the growth of relationships. You get to see the long story arcs. Uh, you get to see the character development over time. You get to see the, and I like this, you get to see the difference between the animation and artistic ability from season one and how it looks in season three and Predacons Rising. Just that like three year period, you can see the advancements in the technology and the design cues and the subtlety that came out the whole way along. Absolute 10 of a Transformers series. And I, like many, long for the day that we get another series that lives up to the expectations that a lot of us fans now have thanks to this pretty much masterpiece series. Anyway, I've gushed long enough. Let me know what you guys think about the Transformers Prime series. I know I loved it. I know it's not for everybody, but certainly was for me. I'd love to hear from you guys. I appreciate you dropping by and giving me some of your extremely valuable time. If you're in a position to help the channel to grow, please hit the donate link down in the description. Of course, hit the subscribe button because that helps me out so very much. Don't forget that somehow, some way, each and every day, you do very much make a difference. And I look forward to the next time that you and I get together to have another visit, either in the live streams at the stop motion premieres or the old fashioned way, right here inside the videos.